Thank you, Melissa. My name is Patrick Milas. I'm the Continuing Education Consultant here at the Bureau of Library Development. As Continuing Education Consultant, I am your go-to person for any and all questions or concerns you have about continuing education, such as webinars and self-paced courses. Together with the State Library and State Archives, the Bureau is a part of the Division of Library and Information Services, which is part of the Florida Department of State. We are a state agency, and if you work for a Florida library, we work for you. You're attending a Bureau of Library Development webinar. It's part of the Library and Information Science Foundations for Professional Practice series. Last week, I introduced some key aspects of information policy relevant to Florida libraries. On November 4th, I will introduce library research methods. Without further delay, Today, I will be focusing on information organization in libraries. Thank you for joining us for this important topic that is so central to effective library operations. During today's webinar, you're welcome to raise your hand if you'd like to ask or respond to a question or make a comment. Melissa will be happy to unmute your microphone so you can verbalize your question or comment. You're also welcome to simply type your question or concern in the chat box that Melissa explained just moments ago. Instant electronic access to digital information is the single most distinguishing attribute of the information age. The elaborate retrieval mechanisms that support such access are a product of technology. But technology is not enough. The effectiveness of a system for accessing information is a direct function of the intelligence put into organizing it. Just as the practical field of engineering has theoretical physics as its underlying base, the design of systems for organizing information rests on an intellectual foundation. The subject of the first portion of this webinar is the systematized body of knowledge that constitutes this foundation of library and information science. You should now see to the right of your screen an image from inside our United States Library of Congress. It's certainly a beautiful image of an impressive space. But where are the books? Where is the information? So much of what library staff do goes on behind the scenes, and one of the major areas for library professional practice, whose extensive detailed work may go invisible to the casual library patron, is the domain of cataloging. Cataloging and the application of information organization principles for technical services will be the focus for the second portion of our webinar. What is information and how can it be organized? How is it organized? How should it be organized? These are immense questions that I ask you to think about as we explore the contours of information organization and cataloging. I would now like to proceed to define metadata and discuss in turn the various classification schemas listed. Metadata, literally data about data, has become a widely used yet still underspecified term that is understood in different ways by the diverse professional communities that create and use information systems and resources. It's a phenomenon that has been around for as long as humans have been organizing information, albeit transparently in many cases. And today we create and interact with it in increasingly digital ways. For the past hundred years at least, the creation and management of metadata has primarily been the responsibility of librarians engaged in cataloging, classification, and indexing. But as information resources are increasingly put online by the general public, metadata considerations are no longer solely the province of library staff. Although metadata is arguably a much less familiar term among creators and consumers of networked digital content who are not informational, information professionals per se, these same folks are increasingly adept at creating and assessing user-contributed metadata, such as web page title tags, hashtags, and social bookmarks. School children and college students are taught in information literacy programs to look for metadata, such as provenance and date information, in order to determine the authoritativeness of information that they retrieve on the web. Thus, it has become more important than ever that not only library staff, but also other creators and users of digital content understand the critical roles of different types of metadata in ensuring accessible and authoritative cultural heritage information and record keeping systems. 
Until the mid-1990s, metadata was a term used primarily by communities involved with the management and interoperability of geospatial data and with data management and systems design and maintenance in general. For these communities, metadata referred to a suite of industry or disciplinary standards for the identification, representation, and technical management of data contained in an information system. Perhaps a more useful big picture way of thinking about metadata is as the sum total of what we can say about any information object at any point. In this context, an information object is anything that can be addressed and manipulated as a discrete entity by a human being or an information system. The object may comprise a single item, it may be an aggregate of many items, or it may be the entire database or record keeping system. In general, all information objects, regardless of the physical or intellectual form they take, have three features, content, context, and structure, all of which can and should be reflected through metadata. Content relates to what the object contains or is about and is intrinsic to an information object. Context indicates the who, what, why, where, and how aspects associated with the object's creation and is extrinsic to an information object. Structure relates to the formal set of associations within or among individual information objects and can be intrinsic or extrinsic or both. Structural metadata indicates how compound objects are put together. For example, how pages are ordered to form chapters. Descriptive metadata describes a resource for purposes such as discovery or identification. It can include elements such as title, abstract, author, and keywords. Content and context are part and parcel of descriptive metadata. Cultural heritage information professionals, such as museum registrars, library catalogers, and archival processors often apply the term metadata to the value added information that they create to arrange, describe, and otherwise enhance access to information objects and the physical collections related to those objects. Such metadata is frequently governed by community developed and community fostered standards and best practices in order to ensure quality, consistency, and interoperability. Let's look at some of those standards now. The Library of Cong Congress subject headings, LCSH, comprise a thesaurus. In the information science sense, a controlled vocabulary of subject headings maintained by the United States Library of Congress. Library of Congress subject headings are an integral part of bibliographic control, which is the function by which libraries collect, organize, and disseminate documents. LCSH predominates in Florida's university libraries. The Dewey Decimal Classification, or DDC, or Dewey Decimal System, is a proprietary library classification system first published in the United States by Melville Dewey in 1876. It is currently maintained by the Online Computer Library Center, OCLC, a library research center. OCLC licenses access to an online version, Web Dewey, for catalogers, and has an experimental linked data version on the web with open access. The decimal classification introduced concepts of relative location and relative index, which allow new books to be added to a library in their appropriate location based on subject. Libraries previously had given books permanent shelf locations that were related to the order of acquisition rather than the topic. The classification's notation makes use of three digit Arabic numerals for main classes with fractional decimals allowing expansion for further detail. A library assigns a classification number that unambiguously locates a particular volume in a position relative to other books in the library on the basis of its subject. The number makes it possible to find any book and to return it to its proper place on the library shelves. The classification system is used in 200,000 libraries in at least 135 countries. So in the image on the right of your screen, you can see two different ways of expressing information. Who is the person in the top right corner? What is the significance of 920.2? 
So Melville Dewey um, is on the, the right um, uh, top part of this slide, and 920 uh, represents biographies in the Dewey Decimal Classification System. 920.2 is specifically biographies of librarians. The other picture is of Fred Kilgore, founder of OCLC, the contemporary cataloging heirs to Dewey's School of Library Economy at Columbia University. Dewey Decimal Classification numbers formed the basis of the Universal Decimal Classification, or UDC, which combines the basic Dewey numbers with selected punctuation marks, comma, colon, parentheses. Adaptations of the system for specific regions outside the English-speaking world include the Korean Decimal Classification, the New Classification Scheme for Chinese Libraries, and the Nippon Decimal Classification, which is Japanese. Despite its widespread usage, the classification has been criticized for its complexity. In particular, the arrangement of subheadings has been described as archaic and as being biased towards an Anglo-American worldview. However, I disagree with the conclusion about the Anglo-American bias. The UDC was actually quite inclusive originally, providing for cultural biases like both Old Testament and Hebrew Bible, where Jewish communities acknowledge the Hebrew Bible as their only testament, and to, to conceive of a New Testament could be offensive. Having both Hebrew Bible and Old Testament can ensure that both reading communities can have access to the information they need. It's really only non-biased if English were the only language, which is a credit to the, to the fact that several other classification schemes for Asian language library services were created and are successful. In the United States, UDC is used primarily in scientific and technical libraries. The State Library of Florida uses the Dewey Decimal Classification. I'd like to spend the next portion of today's webinar moving from the theory and foundations of information organization into the practical dimensions of cataloging and technical services in libraries. I'll introduce the MARC standard and MARC there is an acronym for Machine Readable Cataloging, and the Dublin Core Standard. I'll then move on to Resource Description and Access, followed by ERMs, or Electronic Resource Management Systems. Let's start with MARC Records. Why can't a computer just read a catalog card? Well, the computer needs a way of interpreting the information in a catalog record. A MARC record contains a guide to its data, or signposts, before each piece of bibliographic information. The place provided for each of these pieces of bibliographic information, author, title, call number, etc., is called a field. DDC notations are assigned to the tag 82 in MARC 21. MARC 21 is the current machine-readable cataloging format used in Canada, Great Britain, and the United States since the late 1990s when they have been created for a particular item by the Library of Congress or other national cataloging agency. If you look at the snippet on the right of this slide and look down at the 50 tag, you can see the Library of Congress call number, beginning with BM. In the 82 tag, you'll see the Dewey Decimal number. 100 is the field for the author's name, in this case, Barbara Holdridge, and, and 245 is for the title. Let's have a look at a different way to think about cataloging fields, like author and title. Like MARC records, Dublin Core is a metadata standard widely used in the United States and internationally. It's named for Dublin, Ohio, where it originated, not Dublin, Ireland, just so you know. You should now see the list of Dublin Core elements. What we call fields in the MARC record are referred to as elements in Dublin Core, each Dublin Core element is optional, and each may be repeated. The Dublin Core Metadata Initiative has established standard ways to refine elements and encourage the use of encoding and vocabulary schemes. Thus, I've described the element set on this slide as original, since it can be expected to expand and be enhanced in coming years. Unlike Mark, where we saw a list of fields in order by carefully enumerated tags, 
There is no prescribed order in Dublin Core for presenting or using these elements. These classification elements can themselves be categorized. Dublin Core elements are typically categorized as either content-oriented, intellectual property-oriented, or instantiation. Instantiation simply means a specific example of an information object. So which of these elements on the slide would you think of as content-oriented? Some that are typically associated with content are coverage, description, type, relation, source, subject, and title. The elements on this slide, which are, are more intellectually property related, are contributor, creator, publisher, and rights. And finally, the elements of date, format, identifier, and language belong to the instantiation category. Elements in Dublin Core are particularly inclusive of cataloging concerns arising from items such as eBooks that can be in web-based proprietary subscription access format or a book on CD or an audiobook. Dublin Core is versatile because additional elements can be duplicated as needed to show relationships with other versions of the item. Next, let's look at RDA. Resource Description and Access, or RDA, is a standard for descriptive cataloging initially released in 2010, providing instructions and guidelines on formulating bibliographic data. Intended for use by libraries and related cultural organizations, such as museums and archives, RDA is the successor to the Anglo-American Cataloging Rules, second edition, or AACR2, the prevailing standard for English language libraries since 1978. The primary distinction between RDA and AACR is structural. RDA is organized based on the functional requirements for bibliographic records, or FERBER. These principles identify both the user tasks, which a library catalog should make possible, and a hierarchy of relationships in bibliographic data. Descriptions produced using the instructions of RDA are intended to be compatible with any coding schema, including the data environments used for existing records created under the AACR2 rules. If you look at the right side of this slide, you can see the direction of the foundations of the FRBR or FERBER model. And FERBER again stands for Functional Requirements for Bibliographic Records. A work at the top, a work is a distinct intellectual or artistic creation. So for example, Aaron Copeland's fanfare for the common man would be considered a work. An expression is the specific intellectual or artistic form that a work takes each time it is realized. So for example, the music expressed in a handwritten draft of Aaron Copeland's fanfare for the common man would be an expression. A manifestation is the physical embodiment of an expression of a work. So a performance of Aaron Copeland's fanfare for the common man would be a manifestation, even if it's not recorded. And an item is a single exemplar of a manifestation. The entity defined as item is a concrete entity. So each copy of a recording of Aaron Copeland's fanfare for the common man would be considered an item. Digitization does not equal access. The mere act of creating digital copies of collection materials does not make those materials findable, understandable, or utilizable to our ever-expanding audience of online users. But digitization combined with the creation of carefully crafted metadata can significantly enhance end-user access, and our users are the primary reason that we create digital resources. Electronic Resource Management, or ERM, includes the practices and software systems used by libraries to keep track of important information about electronic information resources, especially internet-based resources, such as electronic journals, databases, and electronic books. 
the development of ERM became necessary in the early 2000s as it became clear that traditional library catalogs and integrated library systems were not designed to handle metadata for resources as mutable, that is, adaptable or changing, as many online products are. One example of an ERM is innovative interfaces. I'd finally like to mention the W3C. W3C stands for the World Wide Web Consortium. The W3C's metadata activity has been across the web. Their initiative to provide a common framework that allows data to be shared and reused across application, enterprise, and community boundaries is called the Resource Description Framework, or RDF. The RDF framework is one of the key enabling standards. The W3C efforts are directed to standards that increase the interoperability of metadata rather than specific metadata schemas. So a new world order based on a theory of everything is at hand. Just kidding. On a serious note, this is an exciting time for the world of information organization and cataloging, and I look forward to future developments. Things have come a long way already. Considering that just 100 years ago, libraries were organizing their shelves based on when a book was bought without regard to its subject, title, author, or any of the other detailed ways we now take for granted as we browse through Florida libraries and search and research online. The first resource you can see featured is our BLD Continuing Education page. From this page, you can register to join our webinars and view our archive of recorded webinars on our YouTube page. So you can find, review, and share last week's Introduction to Information Policy and Libraries webinar, as well as our many other webinars. You may also register for our next webinar in the Library and Information Science Foundations for Professional Practice series. The next webinar, Introduction to Library Research Methods, will be held on November 4th, also at noon. In that webinar, I'll introduce a broad array of research designs and methodologies prevalent in library and information science and take questions about library research methods. Like the other webinars in this series, Introduction to Library Research Methods is designed for new Florida library staff and volunteers with no prior experience or education in research methods. So I encourage you to share this opportunity with any of your new staff or volunteers. As always, you're welcome to send us any questions when you register for a webinar, ask questions verbally, or throughout or through chat during the webinar or anytime afterwards, certainly. Here at the BLD, we love to hear from you, so please keep your questions and suggestions coming. Does anyone have any questions about our uh, the material of information organization today, the series of library professional foundations, or any other questions about the Bureau of Library Development in Florida Libraries? Thanks to my colleague, Melissa Hook, the BLD keeps very active on social media. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our YouTube channel. The potential for you to connect with your Bureau of Library Development is at hand and the pathways to do so are right there on your screen. So join our continuous efforts to communicate and collaborate for the benefit of Florida libraries. Remember that if you work for a Florida library, we work for you. Thank you very much for your attention and participation in this webinar this afternoon. We would really like to hear from you about how we're doing and what other training needs you have. I'll be sending you a follow-up email after the webinar that includes a link to complete the webinar survey, a PDF of the presentation slides, and a link to the webinar recording on YouTube. Do complete the survey if you can. We certainly value your feedback. We will stay online here for a few more minutes to make sure we answer any questions you may have, but that about covers it for today. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon. And if you or your director will be attending the director's meeting next week here in Tallahassee, we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you all online at a future BLD webinar.